We've actually transformed our world in a very short period of time, at least from the vantage point of living things. Technology dominates all aspects of our lives, from medicine to agriculture to energy, communications and transportation. We have technologies our grandparents could not have imagined and that now shadow our world. What is striking is that we've not had a parallel transformation of ideas. Science, government, and law are mummified in ideas developed hundreds of years ago, even though our technologies have rapidly advanced. Bacon and Descartes, Locke and Adam Smith are still the key foundation for the ideas we use to decide about technologies. Our, dea our ideas have not changed so that they guide us to truth and justice, much less beauty and health in the face of our destructive capacities. I doubt that we humans mean to drown ourselves in our waste or foolishness, in the dark side of our technologies. I suspect we just think we'll swim until we sink amidst global warming, endocrine disruption, the loss of biodiversity, and our capacities for destruction through war and terrorism. But there's another choice beyond drowning and sinking. This third choice, this life raft, requires hard work humility and respect. It embodies that which is good and right, that which is beautiful. Some have called this third choice the precautionary principle. I would submit to you that the precautionary principle is one of a handful of ideas with truly transformative power. I'd like to do two things today. First, describe the precautionary principle and a process for implementing it. Second, I want to lay out how science, agriculture, medicine, and law can be transformed by the precautionary principle. The concept of the precautionary principle comes from Germany. The words precautionary principle were translated from the German word Vorsorgeprinzip. A more literal translation of Vorsorge means for caring, caring into the future. The Germans use Vorsorge in the sense of preparing for what may be a difficult future. For 30 years, the principle has been widely used in Europe, mostly applied to toxic chemicals. But in the United States, it's best known as a provision in the preamble of the 1992 environmental treaty known as the Rio Declaration. The Rio Declaration says this, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. And while not poetic, the Rio Declaration contains the core precautionary principle elements that the other 20 or so treaties and domestic laws contain. And the central elements are always scientific uncertainty, the likelihood of harm, and precautionary action. And up until 1998, the precautionary principle was a rather nebulous, ethereal idea. In 1998, we convened the Wingspread Conference on the Precautionary Principle to get it unstuck and get it into motion. We define the precautionary principle as follows. When an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment, precautionary measures should be taken even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. And the wing spread statement went on to lay out four elements of implementation. First, people have a duty to take anticipatory action to prevent harm. And this is really a restatement of the precautionary principle, and I think we put it in just to make sure. You take action before you're certain, and it's to prevent harm, not to manage it, not to think about it, to prevent it. Second, the burden of proof for a new technology, process, activity, or chemical lies with the proponents, not with the public. Another way to frame this is that the polluter must pay for the damage. The notion that the burden of proof rests with the proponents announces up front that society will hold someone accountable. It provides a real impetus for proponents to think carefully about proposed activities before they undertake something hazardous, not afterwards. Is this activity necessary? Are there other ways to accomplish the same ends? But if prevention fails, there's a backup plan. The public isn't forced to absorb the costs of damage. Of course, we're all culpable, and we're all responsible for damaging activities. I flew to this meeting in an airplane. At the same time, there's some technologies or activities where the proponent has more information, or should have more information, about the potential harms, as well as the uncertainties, and so has a greater obligation to prevent damage. 
The third mechanism for implementing the precautionary principle is that people have an obligation to examine a full range of alternatives before starting a new activity, whether it's using a new chemical or a new technology. If this activity is potentially harmful, do we have other options that are less destructive? For instance, if we got serious about ending starvation, are there alternatives to biotechnology, or is that the only method to feed the hungry? Fourth, decisions applying the precautionary principle must be open, informed, and democratic, and must include affected parties. The reason that the precautionary principle requires democratic participation is that when we make decisions that are unresolvable with science, they are, by their very nature, ethical and political. Not that the decisions that we make with science aren't ethical and political, it's just clear that the ones that, are, uh, that we can't resolve with science alone must be made in the political arena. And two, by involving affected parties, we're much more likely to get better science and a better array of options and alternatives. But since wing, since wing spread, we've identified other steps for implementing the precautionary principle. One is to set a goal or establish a vision. Know where you're trying to go. For instance, the Swedish people decided that their goal was that no child would be born with toxic chemicals in his or her body. The goal itself is precautionary, and the pre mechanisms for achieving that goal must also comply with precaution. But perhaps the biggest surprise since wing spread is to uncover and discover the deep ethical dimensions of the precautionary principle. And many of us are motivated to use the precautionary principle because we see the damage in the world, whether it's the cancer of a loved one, the loss of a critter, or the sense that the world is heating up. But ethics? Values? No way. We just didn't even know how to talk about them. But here lies the power of the precautionary principle. It tells us to make decisions with both heart and mind. Too often we've been told that emotions, values, things we love are irrelevant. We've been told that science is king, but king science is held captive by narrow economic interests. Other values have been cast aside. We've sacrificed the environment and public health on the altar of economic gain. I'd like to read a couple of those values that are essential for our survival. Our life depends on gratitude. Our life depends on empathy because we're connected with all creation. Our life depends on compassion, humility, respect, simplicity. And perhaps my favorite, our life depends on humor because life is good and humor disrobes tyranny and absurdity. It is through love for the particular, a child, a neighborhood, a family of otters, a meandering river, that we find our way to a sustaining relationship with the earth and our communities. Is the precautionary principle enough to bring about a transformation of environmental policy? I think so. The old idea of waiting until we count the dead bodies has failed. We keep thinking we can do risk assessments on things for which we have no capacity even to imagine worst case scenarios. How do we do risk assessments on Yucca Mountain, which must contain radioactive waste for 10,000 years? How do we do a risk assessment on an ocean which drives our climate and which is soon going to be warmer than our bathtub? How do we do a risk assessment on an entire generation of children who can only cope by being drugged on Ritalin and Prozac? This is why I believe the precautionary principle is the beginning of an essential transformation in the way we relate both to the earth and to the things we invent. And I'm sorry, sweet child, for scaring you. <laughs> and that chorus is what we should hear, what we should listen to. It is the voice of our children that we should obey and heed. We can set a goal for a beautiful, livable, healthy world. But in order to meet that goal, we'll have to transform some of the pillars of our society, science, agriculture, medicine, and law, and not the least of which is economics. And there are people here who are far more versed in at least economics. Let me describe the necessary transformations beginning with science. 
As I described earlier, scientific uncertainty is key to the precautionary principle. The uncertainty is usually about cause and effect. What opponents of environmental protection would have us believe is that we should wait for the old 18th century science to provide conclusive answers before we take precautionary actions. This is a recipe for big trouble. Wait until the dead bodies of trees, children, and salmon are piled in the streets before we take action. Fortunately, we don't have to wait. We can take science back and have it serve the public good rather than just corporate profits. We can take it back, and let me give you a, a, a good I, a idea from the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Jane Lubchenco. She's called for a new social contract for science. She graciously acknowledges that the old contract that we had with the public has actually been fulfilled. Science provided cures for infectious disease, so our life expectancy has gone up. And science provided for national security with the Manhattan Project. But the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Humor. <laughs> but the contract must now change. She says that on this human-dominated planet, we need to ask science to do something different, to help get us out of the environmental mess. All of life depends on the life support system of the Earth. Science can help us understand that system and help restore the environment so it can continue to sustain life. How should we go about doing that? especially since we don't understand complex biological systems. When we don't know how a chemical is going to function or what the consequences of an activity might be, then we have to live by some basic biological principles, even when we're missing specific facts. The natural step, for instance, lays out ecological systems conditions which are precautionary. And these, I think, are absolute uh, floors. They're not ceilings. These are the bare minimum that's going to let us uh, survive. But they say, society should not produce substances faster than they can be broken down by natural processes, nor should society extract resources at a faster rate than they're replenished, for example, over harvesting trees or fish. I call this one the duh factor. <laughs> Maybe actually we should call the precautionary principle the duh principle, but. Nature uses few chemicals to do lots of things. In contrast, humans use many, many chemicals that are a threat to life, particularly the chlorinated compounds and heavy metals. So I've laid out the scientist's end of the new social contract, but what about the public's part? If we really want a green chemistry and green biology, green economics and green sociology, what do we need to do? First, we should create a public interest, precautionary research agenda. We've allowed special interests, primarily corporations, to dominate the research agenda and to take publicly funded research to make more profits. Corporations like Monsanto have enough money that they don't need the public's money as well. We must tell our legislators what a public interest research agenda would look like, and then we need to fund it. Second, graduate school is the perfect time and place for young scientists to participate in public interest research. What if we made graduate school more like the Peace Corps? It's a wonderful time for graduate students to dedicate a piece of research to the common good. Third, we have to set up regulatory systems that treat every product or practice that is approved for the market as an experiment. That is, we have to monitor BT corn, your household cleaners, and logging and grazing regimes. Then we need to yank technologies and stop activities that we didn't accurately predict would be damaging. We simply cannot put profits over public health and the environment. Now that's a tall order for science. But the impacts on our world, particularly agriculture and medicine, would be profound. Agriculture and medicine are both human attempts to come to terms with complex biological systems. The precautionary principle is crucial at this interface. Agriculture is one of humanity's most destructive practices. Isn't it ironic that what should be an earthy, biological, nourishing process of producing food is in fact one of the most damaging and poisonous? If we can't apply the precautionary principle to agriculture and find a way to feed ourselves without destroying the planet, then the principle is worthless. It seems so easy for a while. Use the bounties of nature for our own advantage. Plant better, more, and bigger crops. Use more efficient methods, more chemicals, and technological advances. Add infinitum. 
the precautionary principle is a direct challenge to that kind of single-mindedness, that kind of hubris. If we're to continue feeding ourselves, we have to step back and realize how big the unknowns have been and what the price has been of ignoring them. The principle is absolutely foreign to that cut it down, use it up, pour on the chemicals, globalize, industrialize, tweak the technology approach of American agriculture. The precautionary principle calls for an end to such reckless behavior in the face of our rampant and awful ignorance. Where should we begin? As Fred Kirshenman said in an article on agriculture and the precautionary principle, we've been asking what we can get away with rather than how to fit our farming into nature. Simply put, under the precautionary principle, we will fit agriculture into nature rather than forcing nature to do our will. I just want to touch on medicine, which, like agriculture, is a profoundly biological activity, which has contributed to the degradation of environmental health and at the same time is scrambling to treat the cancers, birth defects, reproductive disorders, and learning disabilities caused by environmental degradation. The precautionary principle calls for us to prevent environmental health damage even if we can't prove cause and effect. And we, here we recognize that the precautionary principle is not so foreign to American medicine, even the conventional medicine. We're careful about how we treat our bodies, what medicines we put into them. But at the same time that we're careful about those drugs, we've been careful about what we expose our children to. We vaccinate them against all kinds of diseases, but subject them in utero to all kinds of poisons. And in a horrible twist, hospitals have been discharging mercury and dioxins into the environment and then turning around and having to heal the very people made ill by its own practices. This is crazy. The precautionary principle calls for broader, more inclusive medical caretaking. It calls for ecological medicine. And what might you ask is ecological medicine? Ecological medicine promotes environmental health. That is, it promotes the health of all species and recognizes that their health, our health, is interdependent. The health of the redwood, the health of the salmon, the health of the Afghani woman is my health. And in the practice of promoting environmental health, medicine wouldn't cause more environmental damage. Isn't it wonderful? And so we're at a fork in the road. We can continue blundering into an impoverished, degraded, lonely earth devoid of other things and other beings. The precautionary principle maps the possibility of the other choice, a good and whole and beautiful world. 